This is Duke University. I'm sorry, what we're going to do is talk about the events of politics, but through the, um, through the crucible of this play, right? So we have, um, just to get everyone on, on kind of the same page of what the play is, how many of you have seen the play, The Crucible? And this production, that's terrific, thanks. Uh, and how many of you may be familiar, haven't seen it, but you're familiar with the play? Okay, great. So we, a lot of us read it in high school, and, and it's, it's still that same kind, of, um, same kind of heavy experience. Uh, so just to get us thinking about the, uh, the topic, I wanted to share some images and some thoughts about the play. And it's also a time for you to eat, so um, feel free to crunch away. So um, the playwright said about the play in one place, it seems to be produced when a dictatorship is in the offing or when one has just been overthrown. So depending on what side of the political spectrum you're on, you may feel either of those is appropriate. Sorry, there's no room for humor, I guess. <laughs> We're not ready, it's too soon. So let's step away. Um, this is Salem, Massachusetts today. It's a charming uh, Massachusetts, uh, New England sea town. Uh, they fully embrace this, um, this idea of their history with, with the witch trials. They, they actually call it the witch city, and you'll see something like this on a police car. So when you think about that, this great atrocity that was committed in the in the city 300 years before has now become a kind of, kind of badge, somewhat literal. You've got people in witches' costumes walking around, and you also have uh, Wiccans who have made this place a, a place of pilgrimage. So even though the original individuals who were executed here were not witches by, according to most uh, scholarship. It, because of that innocent blood, it has become a place of attraction for um, a spiritual community. There are places like this where you can get your witch-oriented tattoo. There is a statue of Elizabeth Montgomery of bewitched fame. Uh, Elizabeth Montgomery had no actual relation to Salem, Massachusetts. It was just this kitschy statue that they put up that attracts people. You know? They do take somewhat their, their um, history seriously. Uh, this, is, this is a museum that a lot of kids go to or families go to. I grew up in the area, so I remember they would send us, when we were particularly bad, they would send us to the, the, the Salem Witch Museum and we'd be scared. But not quite, because, you know, as a middle schooler, you're not too scared by these dummies. And uh, so it was sort of, it was always like on the edge of being... Um, it's not quite fearful because you can't quite relate to it. And that's one of the reasons we enter a play. It's one of the reasons we have a drama is to enter that world. Because sometimes pictures or figures like this isn't quite enough. This is uh, a historical part of the witch trial. This was the house of one of the judges, uh, Jonathan Corrin, who was a Salem judge. Uh, Jeff Cornell uh, played one of the other judges, who was uh, uh, Judge um, Danforth. Inside the witch house, you've got contemporary um, furnishings. Uh, the light in here is a little, uh, the light in the room, you can't see some of the detail there. But this was a well-furnished house for the day. Oh, great, thank you. 
Um, you can see a little bit more. You can see how plants are hanging, and it was, you know, they're, they're trying to repeat that. This would have been a very posh home for the day, though, with things like European furniture and what have you. Now, just to review uh, a little bit of history about New England, uh, the Mayflower landed in 1620 at Plymouth Rock. Salem was one of the first cities or towns founded. Uh, in 1626, actually before Boston was founded. Boston, of course, became the center, uh, the center of government. But Salem was older. Puritans get a bad rap for being particularly grumpy or colorless or what have you. But it was actually one of the great qualities of the Puritans, which was their unity and their ability to work together that allowed them to survive and to become the, the foundation stone of European colonization, we'll say. Uh, if you look at, for example, the Roanoke Island, if you've been out to the Lost Colony, if you look at Jamestown, they, there was the attempt at Euro European colonization, but it did not work. They could not sustain it. It was because of Puritan unity the people working together, and actual self-sacrifice. So when you think about it, it was giving, uh, it was the fact that they were willing to give over to others that allowed them to survive together. Um, this was in, mostly Massachusetts was civilized. When you looked at Maine and New Hampshire, they were mostly pioneering or trading, uh, trading areas with the, uh, with the native peoples. They would trade with them. And uh, the town that I grew up in, uh, Exeter, New Hampshire, was 1638, but it was a very small town at that point, founded by someone who didn't quite agree religiously with the, um, the general Puritan community. And you also have the Indian Wars, which were very disruptive for the New England, uh, the New England colonists and, of course, the Native Americans. The Indian Wars were a time of eruption when it was no longer going well between the, <laughs> the native people and the colonists, and the French got involved, and of course the French and the English are always ready to go at it in this period of history. And so you've got between 1675 and 1678 the first, but then it erupted again. And if you notice the dates, the second French-Indian War was 1688 to 1699. In the middle of that is when the Salem Witch Trials uh, is taking place. It's an important aspect of the feeling of fear and terror that surrounded uh, the, co the colony at that point. There was a very, and sorry, the, those wars were mainly affecting those places, the trading areas in Maine, New Hampshire, somewhat in Massachusetts as well. But what was happening was the people would get, they would get either massacred or they would run away and they'd go right back to Essex County. So the Essex County, I'll show you. This is a picture of Northern New England of the time in the 16, late 1600s. And if you can see, I, oh, I've got one of these things so I can show you. <laughs> That's Boston right there. And this is Cape Cod. And then you've got Salem Town right there. And this is the small coast of New Hampshire here with Portsmouth there. And then up the coast, you've got, if any of you have been up here, this is lovely, right? This is where the, some presidents have their uh, summer homes. And, uh, but at that point, it was outposts. And this is where a lot of the activity of the war was happening. And the people would come from up here back here. And so their stories would start to people, um, it, they would start to infect the people's thoughts. This is uh, Essex County, which is, uh, this is Salem Town, right? So Salem is the port town, which is right here. Salem Village is where the, is where the witch hysteria broke out. Salem Village is no longer there. That land is there, but it's now called Danvers. Uh, Salem Village was something everyone was ready to wipe off the map after this experience. 
But if you notice, this map itself indicates where witches came from or where they were accused. And in each of these towns, the fever spread. So it was not limited to Salem. It soon spread to a lot of them, including Andover. Andover was a, a hotbed, like a second wave after Salem Village with, with the with accusations of witchcraft. The interesting thing is, uh, Andover, people just gave right in and said, oh, you must be right, I must be a witch. I didn't know it, but I'm a witch. Everyone gave in, and it was an exercise in absurdity because it just spread infinitely. And that was because they were so devoted to one another that they knew that it was better for the community if they gave in. It was really a beautiful expression of the actual Puritan unity, whereas in Salem Village, Salem Village was very different. Salem Village was the most obnoxious uh, one of these uh, little communities, and everyone knew it. If you asked anyone in this area, in any of these neighboring towns, if the devil were to appear anywhere, where would it be? He would say Salem Village. He or she would say Salem Village. Why? Because these people were at each other all the time. They were arguing with their neighbors. They were suing their neighbors. They were not happy with Salem Town, they were not happy with the communities around, there were border disputes, and you get that. If you remember from The Crucible, uh, Giles Corey, who was played by Ray, I'm sorry, Ray, I'm hitting you with the laser, <laughs> um, was, was in the court how many times? Uh, 33 times in his life, six times in the last week. <laughs> okay, right. That was the attitude. There were, there were, there were a cantank Cantankerous, fractious group. This is a map of Salem Village. And you, it actually shows you where each home is. In 1692, there's about 80 homes there, about 200 people. And this would become, and people really study this and map it out and understand each nook and cranny of that place. Into this fractious environment, came an opportunist, okay? Samuel Paris was someone who had failed. He didn't, he didn't graduate from Harvard. He, he went to Harvard, he didn't graduate. He went back to a colony in Barbados, failed to make it there, and so he was forced to leave Barbados. He tried being a merchant in Boston, failed at that, he's middle-aged, He's got a family, he's trying, to make it la he's trying to make it work one last time, and he digs his heels in, in Salem Village as the minister. This is his, the foundation of his little home. There's some discussion about this in the play. Uh, the most famous book, the Harry Potter of the day, would have been the works of Cotton Mather, and Cotton Mather was writing about witchcraft. He had experience, firsthand experience with witches, right? Or a girl who was possessed. And he wrote this bestseller and became famous because of it. It helped that he had a famous father. Um, now look, this is Salem Village. Uh, if you look, this is a map where, that shows where the accuse, accusers were and where the accused lived. Now, what do you notice? It's basically divided in half. You know, we were all looking at maps all last night, I'm guessing, right? And you see divisions in maps. And this map is, shows, it showed like the, it shows the fault line that was there already that Samuel Paris took advantage of. Now, how did he do that? He, when he came into town, um, when he became minister, how many, in the play, it talks about how many ministers um, they had gone through, remember? Third in seven years. Mm -hmm. Third in seven years, right? And so there were actually four uh, of this little parish within about 15 years. They couldn't keep a minister. They kept driving their minister away. This is a stubborn uh, people. And what you've got is um, 
him coming into the situation, and they try to drive him out. But he digs in, and he starts, he starts with this, uh, this preaching style where they are, we are the elect of God, we are the angels, anyone outside of this church, anyone who is not a member of the church, like a, a committed member of the church, is a, a minion of Satan. Okay, and this goes on and on and on. And who is in the audience hearing these things day after day? His children, the children of the other members of that, of that parish. He would not allow others to come into his church for communion. The other people in the village who were not part of the church, they could come in to hear his fiery sermon, and then he would send them out, and they weren't allowed to take communion. This was very uh, atypical of the preachers, of the ministers of the day. And so this kind of behavior, this poison coming out day after day after day was ingested especially by the young. And the young start, these young also had family members who had been uh, killed or terrorized during all the Salem, uh, sorry, during all the Indian Wars. Think about that. All of this terror and fear arising in the young. Arthur Miller in The Crucible finds the problem was with like the, these girls who were hiding their guilt for these teenage sexual fantasies or whatever it is. Scholarship says it was, it seems to be in this kind of poisoning, brainwashing of them until they just responded with these outbursts. Okay. Now those outbursts ended up targeting one child after another. There's a beautiful scene at the end of the first act in the crucible where the children are just start accusing one after another. And it's a very troubling scene, uh, you might remember. And some of those names that are mentioned there are the very ones who were, some of the very ones who were executed. Uh, Goody Osborne died in prison here in actual March. Uh, Goody Good was, uh, she was like one of the first ones named. She was arrested February 29th um, and executed then. Bridget Bishop was one of the original, well, she was the first one executed. Uh, others had died, including infant children in prison. Altogether, you, only, you had um, over 150 people in prison for this, and this is just spreading like, like wildfire throughout this area. And 25 would eventually lose their lives. These are their names. This is the spot where they believe the hanging was done. Uh, those of you who remember from the play John Hale, the character, he was an actual minister from Beverly who later uh, regretted his involvement like he does in the play. And he wrote this book um, called A Modest Enquiry into the Nature of Witchcraft. And he died that same year in 1697. Salem does uh, memorialize this and keep up um, these places. This is the Salem Witch Trial Memorial. This is the stone of John Proctor. Giles Corey, who was pressed to death. This was the part played by Ray. This is the monument for Rebecca Nurse, who was um, probably considered the least likely to be a witch. And um, her memorial, written 200 years later, says, O Christian martyr who for truth could die, when all about thee owned the hideous lie, the world redeemed from superstition sway is breathing freer for thy sake today. It's a lovely spot. I just want to go through some of the causes of this mass hysteria. On the social level, it's that divisiveness, the, the mistrust, the factionalism. Individuals who are fearful 
who are filled with terror. Also superstition, susceptibility to influence. With a politic on the political level, in Salem Village, they didn't have an appropriate way of working out their conflicts. So there was inadequate means of resolving conflicts, and they had a leader or leaders ready to take advantage of those factions to lift themselves into prominence. I'll just repeat that. A leader ready to take advantage of factions to lift himself into prominence. So Arthur Miller sees this play in through the prism of McCarthyism. He says, the central impulse for writing was the interior psychological question of that guilt residing in Salem which the hysteria merely unleashed but did not create. It was an attempt, the play, was an attempt to say that one couldn't passively sit back and watch the world being destroyed under him even if he did share the general guilt. I was calling for an act of will. I was trying to say that injustice has features. He also said the crucible stresses individual conscience as the ultimate defense against a tyrannical authority. And of course, John Proctor was his main vehicle for that idea. This is what Miller said about McCarthy. Just about anything that flew out of his mouth, no matter how outrageously and obviously idiotic, could be ma made to land in an audience and stir people's terrors. Kind of loud. The terror in these people was being knowingly planned and consciously engineered, and yet all they knew was terror. And uh, just one last thing quote here. We know how close to the edge we live and how weak we really are and how quickly swept by fear the mass, of, the mass of us can become when our panic button is pushed. It is also, I suppose, that the play reaffirms the ultimate power of courage and clarity of mind whose ultimate fruit is liberty. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to know uh, if any of the uh, wrong authors who did the accusing ever had a, uh, a change of heart as adults and write anything down to reflect writings from those who were the accusers. I think Betty Paris was the only one who actually wrote something down. She was, if you remember the play, she's the first one in bed. Uh, she was nine years old when she started having these eruptions. Uh, Abigail was 11. <laughs> Abigail was, was only 11. She was not the, the teenager that, or the 17 year old that, that what did Miller made. What did Betty Paris say? She said she was uh, possessed by the devil in in claiming those things. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So with that in mind, I wonder whether Ray and um, Jeffrey, if you want to, in the sense of approaching, you're sort of at two different sides of the characters that we see. The ones with um, whom sort of Giles unwittingly seems to participate in accusations as his contentiousness and the one who adjudicates this, and then sort of deals with knowing that things have gotten out of hand, but having no capacity outside of the system that's already been set forward to try and change, right? The only thing that can change things is for people to confess. And driving forward in that, um, I think both how do you approach those characters in terms of a contemporary situation that we could argue is makes this even more present, um, but then also how you feel Miller is, 
placing these characters as examples of how to be in a space that invite when this hysteria has kicked up. Uh, um, one of the things Miller seems to be saying is that the um, legal and religious infrastructure at this time was inadequate to meet the perfect storm, if you will, of uh, phenomena that hit all at once. In terms of my character, a very contentious man who is uh, very quick to be riled over any s per perceived slight, uh, constantly suing his neighbors over land deals and any anything having to do with uh, defamation of his character, knows the law very well and uses it uh, as a, 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 a really a divisive um, uh, tool at first, but then finally at the end, those of you may may know that he in fact turns on a, on a very clear point of law once he himself is arrested. Uh, if he does not confess, or if he does not plead guilty or innocent, he dies a Christian, as it was under the law. And so instead of his property being forfeit to the state and then auctioned off, he dies with his property intact, and it goes to his sons. And that is what he chooses to do because he knows the law. And so he's put in a pit and heavy stones are laid on him to make him confess. And apparently from the, what, the research we did, it was two days that he lay there. And finally was, the weight was such that it killed him. At age 83, it <laughs> still took two days. Um, as, as they say, he was a fearsome man, Giles Corey, in the play. Uh, but the, but the fascinating, uh, among the fascinating things about the play is that the, just the inadequacy of the tools available, this 80 years before the advent of the United States Constitution, the inadequacy to deal with this conflation of public and private grievance, all stoked by the fear and the, this atmosphere of the terror of the wars that are happening, and of course the vast expanse of the forest to the west. Who knows what might be out there? You can imagine that feeling. And then um, the Reverend Paris uh, stoking these flames all at once. And uh, the system that had, as Mark was saying, the unity was there in the community, but then it got shattered by these pressures. And at that point, people started behaving uh, irrationally and look, looked for supernatural. Miller's very careful to build this case. We meet first Goody Proctor, Putnam, thank you, Goody Putnam, who has lost seven babies uh, at birth, essentially. Now, today, we would know a medical or scientific reason for that. Uh, there was none at that time, and so why not look to the unnatural? Why not look to the theological? If you're going to explain it, our urge to have control, at least to put a name and a control on, on, on what's on this chaos around us, leads to this explanation. And uh, that is one of the main, Miller's careful to build his play, so that's one of the main themes that leads to the arrest of Rebecca Nurse and others in the play, the ex trying to explain phenomena through either um, uh, uh, the, the idea of witchcraft or a theological uh, reference point. Yeah, and even um, Reverend Hale yeah. says to Proctor, surely there is a murderous attack upon this village that cannot be explained by the vengeance of a little girl. There has to be something. Look, He says, look to cause proportionate. God wouldn't be so involved with such a petty cause. There has to be a reason. And so that, that seeking for pattern, seeking for an explanation for that which is phenomena or unexplained, or just in this case, a hysterical ch child, there must be a reason for that hysteria, especially when there's more than one. 
Um, and so that seeking of patterns brings people to break charity with each other. As Giles mm -hmm. Corey says in his, his first interaction with Judge Danforth, I didn't mean to accuse my wife of being a witch. I just was confused at why she was reading books. Um, and he breaks down in tears. I have broke charity with her. I have broke charity with her. And Miller makes a point of that image of that idea of breaking charity. It seems to be what he saw, as Mark uh, delineated for us, that that community had broken charity with each other. And they had that, that, those connections, those bonds, that, that empathy, that, a bit, that willingness to reach out and understand led to a fractured community. And that was, that was the, the opportunity for that was the kindling for a match of resentment, a match of opportunism, a, na a match of self-interest to set a fire uh, blazing. Uh, yes, and adding to that, and, and this maybe uh, goes to why Miller is a, a, a really great playwright. When, when Hale says that, look to cause proportionate, is there perhaps some hidden abomination? Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out there was mm -hmm. in this world. It was the fact that John Proctor had had uh, an adulterous relationship with the, his serving girl. And it hadn't come to light. And so, it, again, looking at a theological um, explanation of things, Hale is, in fact, in a way, right. And Miller's careful to write in his stage directions that as Hale leaves, Proctor is, has been, he writes something like, he has been affected by what Hale has said. And... And my character, Giles Corey, when uh, the way I chose to play that scene, I'm there listening to this. And what, what we do know that nobody else in the village, it's been seven months since Abigail has been put out by Proctor's wife because she, she knows, but no one else has asked for her services. So there may be some kind of a rumor going on around town that something went on. And when Hale says, look to cause proportionate, you know, Giles may have heard something in the wind. In my next line, I say, John, tell me, are we lost? Mm -hmm. And then he says, uh, I'll come back tomorrow. And, and Giles says, let you think on it. Mm -hmm. We'll come early, eh? And he goes. It's interesting in... Um, in Miller's adaptation of Ibsen's uh, Enemy of the mm -hmm. People. You were in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I was away at that semester, which is why I have to ask. Um, but again, Miller goes to a length to not make it cut and dry in the sense that there's a sense that Dr. Stockman maybe is a little too much in love with his own righteousness. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a human story as well as a political polemic. And the same kind of idea may be at work here that Proctor did, in fact, transgress. And there is some kind of explanation of this that that contributed, because Abigail, if that hadn't happened, Abigail wouldn't have become hysterical trying to kill his wife so she can take over. Miller's careful to make this case in the play. Um, so M Miller doesn't settle for the cut and dry, the easy explanation. He adds the human element to it, which is um, tremendously rewarding when you're working on a play like this. We want to talk about that? Well, and I think that's the great opportunity and invitation and challenge to us when we watch the play is that here is this flawed man who is about to, so we think, confess, to give his lie, to save his life, and yet chooses honor at the last moment and sacrifices himself for his goodness, realizing in that act he attains that goodness and perhaps that redemption. And that's, that's a challenge to all of us, I think. Would we do that? Would we have made that choice? Would we have saved our life? When it seems there is evil, how best to fight that evil? Capitulate, play the game, fight another day, 
or take a stand, pay the price, and run up your banner high on, on, your, uh, on your flagpole of honor? Uh, it's a question. I'm not sure there's one right answer to that. Elizabeth says to her husband, I want you living. That's sure. I can't condemn you. I can't judge you about what's best to do in a situation like that. And there may not be, well, I think there is a right answer. I think, I think we're supposed to take Proctor as sacrifice as, as, a, as inspiration. But it's not an easy uh, destination to arrive at. Well, you have the dimensions of pride. There's a pride that provo provokes the inability to you know, confess to what has happened, right? So the things that are happening in the Proctor household set the stage for what becomes uh, the inciting incident for other things along with a climate um, there. So his pride in that moment is his undoing and his pride in the end is his redemption in some sense. And dimensions of pride, I think, and if I want to go back to this notion of charity, because he's also setting it in a space that I think Ray's already alluded to where we didn't have systems of governance to reinforce or to negotiate between religion and uh, citizenship. Um, that's what we looked to the Constitution to do, to establish those spaces where we could um, come to a neutral body or a neutral understanding. And yet Miller's writing this play in a moment of constitutional crisis, right? So that, too, even in our best structures, there isn't necessarily a way forward when such a profound stoking of hysteria, such a demand or and such ties of power to the ability to um, make judgments on people, catastrophic judgments, right, um, about who you are, what you get to do, um, who has standing in America. Um, those are, um, so even something that was so agreed upon and we go back to is also something that can be under threat, right? Um, and, and what will men do, what will citizens do in that? What will be the road that you take, right? So Miller's road, I think sort of, and Mark, you might want to speak to this, in terms of what Miller did in terms of testifying amongst, uh, you know, in relationship to HUAC and other artists who did not, right, or who took a different path and proceeded to have maybe short-term game, but now we look at them differently. Let me set that up. Uh, uh, in, uh, Jeff has brought uh, Miller's wonderful biography, mm -hmm. autobiography, Time Bends, which is a, a beautiful book, a beautifully written book. But um, one episode uh, from there has always stuck with me, and it'll feed into what Mark's going to say. Miller had gotten word that he was going to be summoned. And so he, he left his house, and he went and stayed in a hotel. And somehow, I forget exactly how he got a phone call, or he was watching out the window, and he saw what appeared to be an FBI agent or whoever it was, was coming. So he quickly gathered a few things, opened the door, started down the hallway. At that point, the elevator opened. And the guy walks out of the elevator and walks past Miller. The guy heads down to Miller's room. Miller gets to the elevator. Could have gotten on the elevator and gone down, and he stopped. And he turns, he walks back, and he says, I think you're looking for me. And that was his moment of facing it. And then at that point, he is summoned before the committee. Yeah, well, he, he would have done that four years after he wrote the play. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the play was his imagination building up his own courage. Right? And I think it's an, some of us who, uh, what, what ended up happening was he, he was brought before uh, the House of uh, Un-American Activities, the House of Un-American Activities Committee. Um, and, and he he responded to the questions, but he was told ahead of time that he would not give any names. He would not think about this parallel with mm -hmm. the witch trial, right? That you were supposed to, the thing to do was to name names. You would go forward and you say, yes, I'm so sorry, um, my friend Ray is also a communist, as is my friend Jeff. Can I go now? Right. 
And he was told he would not uh, be asked to do that. And he was asked to do it, and he refused. So he was held in contempt mm -hmm. because of that. And because of that, he was blacklisted. Uh, but this was also late in the season. Mm -hmm. uh, this was 1956. McCarthy only had one year left on this planet. Um, and the, just similar to the way it happened in Salem Village, or in Salem, there was an, there's a, a lifespan to it. It started out quiet, it reached its height, and then it petered out as people lost energy for it, as they lost willingness to keep submitting to it. The same thing happened with McCarthyism. Uh, a lot of blood had been shed, and everyone kind of walked away from the, the room, I think. Do you have something, Jeff, you want to add? I just, it just struck me, this his perception of what was going on with that very demand to name, and he says this, I saw the hearings in Washington that they were prof profoundly and even avowedly ritualistic. After all, in almost every case, the committee knew in advance what they wanted the witness to give them, the names of the comrades in the party. The FBI had long since infiltrated the party, and informers had long ago identified the participants in various meetings. The main point of the hearings, precisely as in 17th century Salem, was that the accused make public confession, mm -hmm. damn his confederates as well as his devil master, and guarantee his sterling new allegiance by breaking disgusting old vows, whereupon he was let loose to rejoin the society of extremely decent people. In other words, the same... Uh, Spiritual nugget lay folded within both procedures, an act of contrition done not in solemn privacy but out in the public air. This public shaming, this bringing to the feet of those of us that will claim the mantle of goodness and righteousness and cleanness, that public um, self-humiliation is, was what was sought, uh, so that there would be no doubt as to those tenets that we will adhere to and those which we shall decry and proscribe. I think that's why we get the term political theater sometimes in that sense of how, which I think gives theater sometimes a pushback against whether we are a place that reinforces those rituals and how to perform them or push against it. But the invocation of that is that it's a ritual that we all know the ending to, right? And we play our parts, and within those parts become sort of expectations, and it's about how well we conform to that is how successful we are. Um, and that makes the proceeding empty, but ritual, it sort of has a communal ritual component that can be positive, I'm trying to think of an example, but tends often to be negative or to be um, conforming an authority that is already trying to put aside certain people as proper and certain people as, as um, not, as outside. You want to take questions? We have about 10 minutes left. I don't put it, I know we're all at the maybe exhausted point. I'll, I'll throw, I'll throw. <laughs> um, in that sense of, so what do we do? What does art do in response to this? We do the crucible often, I think. The idea of the play being done, it's a year, it's a year after Miller's centennial, right? So a lot of productions of the crucible are happening this year for lots of different reasons. But I guess in thinking about, as theater artists, we see Miller offering us one solution of how art responds to crisis. Well, I mean, since Danforth, the judge that I played, who, who seems so ruthless, he, he adheres to the law so much that he will continue his mistake even as he begins to recognize it himself. And he will, as he says in the play, hang 10,000 people that would dare rise against the law to preserve that law. 
So if we have people that will do that in the name of the law, then we have to make sure that our laws are reflective of our ideals. And so we may need to change those laws or change um, what they will make people do in their service. So um, there are things that we can do. Yeah. Um, do you want to... I mean, it's about conversation. It's about advocacy. It's about... Um, not being uh, giving into inertia or complicitness for that because that's the way things are. I mean, it gets into what Brecht would say is the is the, the political theater of go out and uh, change the world. Don't don't accept it because it's just because that's the law. Oh well, you can't fight city hall. Well, yes, you can, and find a way to do that. You know, you're not you're not citizen. You're not sitting in the theater. You're mm -hmm. sitting in the world. Go, go do something. I, I don't know what tools we pick up yet, but I think we, I think the, I think the call is to is to pick up some tool. I'm thinking of Discord too. Is Discord is not as we if in the way that we've set it up in this conversation today is that people breaking charity with one another over and over again produces a difficulty to be a community, but Discord is also sometimes productive. Mm -hmm of necessary change. So how do you manage discord, or how does discord become something that overtakes? Or how does discord become a point of, of meeting to where then potentially we build mechanisms to back towards charity, right? So that anger is not, uh, is not disavowed, but is not a, seri a sincere, a, the only solitary motivating factor, right, ultimately to build back towards some measure of community. I know you have a question. I think, I think when, when you all are talking about, uh, I think there's a, there's, a, I think there's a clear struggle between, I think there's a clear struggle between power and community. And if you can relate the crucible to what's going on today, I think that's, that's where the change can, can happen. And I think the, those in power are, have more fear of the community. So, um, through, through the play and what's going on what's going on today I think uh, communities have to make um, make a change in their own selves and make a decision without asking anyone above them saying well can we can we communicate can we form a community and we're not living in that world where we can't do that anymore we can do that and that's what I'm getting from from what you all are talking about we we need to get back to a sense of community and stop letting the powers that be, uh, I mean, the powers that be are gonna be who they are, you know, and we're not saying you should change because you can't change anyone, uh, but communities uh, have to stop saying we can't be a community unless we get in touch with the powers that be. Mm -hmm. We have to form a community, just like the powers have formed their power, communities have to form their community. Mm -hmm. There's, a, t to that point, there's a, a moment in the play, Act Four, in fact, it's uh, Jeff's the scene where they talk about the neighboring town of Andover that got together and threw out the courts. <laughs> they said, no, we're not doing this anymore. Get out. And uh, uh, that goes, I think, sir, directly to your point. They, the community said, no. And it was charity that was behind that. Yeah. Right? It was the charity of the people with each other. Uh, I think, I think uh, we have to Whatever group we're in, there is a, there's an opportunity for bringing together, and there is an opportunity for dividing. And um, I was talking about the play with my class yesterday, um, and I asked them, well, what's the job of a minister in a community? And you know, they're mostly Christian kids from North Carolina, and they said to bring together that community, unify that community, right? And uh, so the verb to minister means to heal, right? To pull together, and so uh, you don't need to be ordained to do that. In whatever gathering you're in, find a way to pull together people, and and not not I mean, somehow fight that urge in yourself to capitalize on the moment, right? In theater, we always look at ourselves as being through the character. Right, like 
how do we empathize with any character, like with a Danforth or with a Samuel Paris or, or an Abigail Williams? How do we look at that character as an expression of human, the human journey that we could be on? We could be on that. And that there are choices to be made. Now, whatever journey, we're on all, you know, like 60 different journeys or how many people are here, maybe 50. We're in different journeys. But we can take each moment, we can take, we can take advantage of it to boost ourselves at the, at the expense of division. Or we can use it to maybe sacrifice a little bit of ourselves to bring healing. So I, I don't see any other way to, I mean, how else do we move through the day conscientiously? I definitely feel and like kind of resonate with bringing together the community and uh, I guess as, as, well, as we've said before, but I guess I'm not sure it's really covered in the play, but what would you do with apathy if people don't care about what kind of community they're in or they're just not very, like, they just don't care about where, where the community would go? I guess I'm not sure the play covers that, but I don't know, it was just a question that I've had. Tell them stories about what happens when you don't care. Or tell them inspiring stories of what happens when you do. <laughs> In the play, it seems that uh, it's hinted that even those who don't care eventually get swept up right. in the hysteria. Well, because Proctor, too, doesn't necessarily care about the church, but as the church is the center of his community, or he cares but doesn't care. He wants to be in and out and negotiate that and the sort of tensions that that allows him as a landed property owner and to not participate, and then that becomes the thing that's used against him as a proof of not doing is proof of doing something else, yeah. right? He's choosing to not do. That's right. Mm -hmm. So the idea that apathy, whether we want to take any recent examples as um, forewarning of that, that to stand outside might for a moment, but we all are in space together. We are all in a communal space together. So how much you choose to step outside and where your privileges protect you from that, you are still impacting what happens to others. So I think Jeffrey's story about telling stories or sort of noting gently doing that has had an effect on someone else. And can I tell you that that brings you not to be righteous in your apathy, but to invite you back in for whatever has pushed you away? Well, right? I wanted to, to comment both on the apathy and on the community. Um, uh, this, this week, um, I, I have a very good friend who's from Thomasville, and although he lives in Chapel Hill and he's very liberal and worked for Hillary, his mother is part of a very, very large community, um, a religious community in Thomasville. And their minister stood, as he does every election, stands um, for weeks at a time before the congregation to say, we as a community need to come together and vote for Trump. And despite having this very liberal, smart, educated son, you know, she she sticks with her community, so that's where she gets her support, and that's what she does, and that's what every single person at that church voted for Trump. And I had my own, in terms of apathy experience, working for the Democratic Party at the um, health center in downtown Durham, doing my part to get people to register and drive them, and in that case, just walk them one block to go vote, early voting, and I was there for three hours with two other people. There were nonstop people coming through the door, and none of us succeeded in getting a single person. And they were registered to walk the one block to early vote, where we would help them, assist them, whatever. Um, and they, they did vote, in most cases, for Obama. We couldn't convince them to tell them the story, to tell them lots of stories about what, in a Supreme Court and what, you know, how it would affect their lives personally. We did not succeed in getting a single person. So I'm really discouraged about whether we can succeed in doing any of these blocking things. Mm -hmm. 
I would say, though, too, we have these, the presence of such insurmountable obstacles have existed for a long time. And we have forged together. We have paid prices. And some of us in certain communities have paid more. And I was heartened to see people waking up to also sort of say, I have seen this before, and I have lived, and I will see it through again, and I will find a way. I, well, I mean, again, that's the sense of what are our choices within that, and how do we confront, I think, what is a, a palpable dismay in that same way? But I think Miller, I, as, as just the occasion to have the crucible was to, re, to revisit those years in the 50s, which we hear a lot about the 50s, sort of leave it to Beaver, and we do not hear a lot about the 50s political sort of space that I think was extremely frightening and very real uh, in a way that we imagine we haven't experienced before in the US and we fear we might be in a space to do it again. So I, I think, not to be Pollyannish, but there's potential in every crisis in the crucible, right? In what we will forge out of a particular kind of fire together. That at least is one thing to hold on to mm -hmm. as we move ahead. And I think we're out of time. I think that's all we have yeah. time for. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks.